Good afternoon, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. I'm Penny Morris, president of the Mitchell County Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and each year, the, uh, the National Historic Trust has a May is Preser Preservation Month theme. And this year, the theme was discovering your community's hidden gems. So the Preservation Commission met, and well, we have many hidden gems. I'm coming up with a list, but we thought we would pick places that um, are not on a main traveled road, that if you weren't going there, you probably wouldn't find them, uh, and let people know some of the, the wonderful treasures that we have in Mitchell County. Um, and because one of our commission members is a member of this church, we thought it would be a couple of reasons to start with the Mona Church because, you know, people, they turn on Mona Drive and they just keep going. They don't know the church is here. So it is a, a, a church, a place that's not on the, on the main traveled road. And, you know, we have a, a commission member that could give people a wonderful history of the church, its importance to the community, and so we thought we'd start our, our month with Pomona Church. And, and without any, any other comments, I will introduce Kurt Meyer, member of the Mona Lutheran Church. Thank you, Penny. It's, um, it's great to have uh, you all here. Welcome to Mona Lutheran Church. This uh, congregation was formed in 1876 the year of the nation's centennial, with this church then being erected in the early 1880s. It's a little bit cloudy as to exactly when the church was built, at least cloudy in the church records that I looked at. But it was uh, built in a manner, as you can see, that's consistent with Norwegian uh, Lutheran architecture of the day, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the features in just a moment. This church, as Penny mentioned, is a Klaus Klaassen church. Uh, it was founded shortly after the rail line reached Mona. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Boston in a few minutes also. The town's origin dates to 1869, and then the congregation was founded in 1876. It took them seven years, more or less, to form this um, congregation after the uh, community was formed. The congregation first met in the Mona School, which is located at we don't really have blocks in Mona, but two blocks, um, two blocks east. The Mona School that is now there is not the Mona School where the church was founded, however. There were several different Mona schools. The sanctuary where you're now sitting is as uh, is much today as it was in, in, in the 1880s when it was built. As a result, entering the church sanctuary today is a bit like walking back in time into the 1880s. In terms of design and architecture, this is this sanctuary is remarkably similar to the first and original Norwegian Lutheran church in this country, which was built by Norwegian immigrants in Muskego, Wisconsin, which is near Milwaukee. That building is now located on the campus of uh, Luther Seminary in St. Paul, except the pulpit in that church is right in the center. So as you look at the altar, the altar is lower, and the pulpit, when the pastor ascended the pulpit, he was going above the altar. Quite dramatic. Here, obviously, the pulpit is uh, to my immediate left, your right, and the altar stands alone. The sanctuary is now painted in traditional, rather dark, subdued colors, one of the few Norwegian Lutheran churches in the Midwest with this traditional Scandinavian folk color scheme. The interior painting took place in 18, uh, excuse me, 1998, an effort instigated by uh, Pastor Russ Wangen, who was then the pastor of this uh, congregation. And Russ is a Norwegian Lutheran to the core of his soul, so it was, uh, it was with his uh, direction that the church was painted these colors. Oh, but the colors look so dark, people said. They can't be right, yet they are right. I find them to be exceptionally beautiful. Don't you agree? I, um, I also wanted to point out several other features that you can see upon entering this building. First, the curved altar rail 
This is a very consistent pattern in Scandinavian churches. The concept being not the half arc, but rather the full circle. The idea being a uh, communion with the saints. Now the saints that you commune with here that are physically present are on this side. The saints that you commune with that complete the circle are invisible to us, yet they are with you at the communion realm. I also want to point out the beautiful altar painting. This, um, I had a friend who was very into Scandinavian matters, and she said, I bet the Mona Church has a hairborn Gausta altar painting. And I said, oh, if only we did. No, we do not have a Gausta painting. Gausta was one of the more famous uh, itinerant um, altar painters. Uh, he was born in 18... 54, and he could have painted it. In this case, he did not. The name on this painting is Olsen, O-L-S-E-N. Presumably the E suggests he was probably a Dane like Klaus Klaassen himself. And I do not think the painting is original to the church. I think the painting came in the teens or the 20s. Uh, I'm not exactly certain. I'll have to do a little bit more research on that. But I think that uh, Olsen was probably a Dane. I think he did a magnificent job. The strong vertical lines. Also, we... The idea in many, in many churches where, where the face of Christ is captured, Christ looks quite Scandinavian. Here, the face of Christ. Christ is distinctly from the Middle East. And I say thanks be to God for the authenticity here. Um, the Rose Molly, if you, if you turn and see on the, uh, on the, uh, on the balcony, there is a Rose Molly, there is uh, some Norwegian uh, written there. Um, it's, uh, this was all done also by uh, Pastor Russ Long, and he was, uh, he was not, not only a, a marvelous pastor, he was also quite a, uh, an artist and a craftsman. And so uh, I took a picture of this and sent it to uh, relatives of ours in uh, Norway, and they got back and they said, it's just beautiful. I should point out there is a typo in one case. And I said, well, you know, it's not really a typo if you paint it in Rosemont. It's got to be a rose model or something. So it, 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 there's, there's, there's an, an error up there. I don't know where it is. Perhaps you know Norwegian better than I. You can tell me where the, where the error is there. Um, the choir loft here is also a traditional feature of Scandinavian architecture. The choir loft now, we have the singing of the music rather than the singing of choirs, which is also reflective of, of what's happened in a lot of these uh, smaller uh, country churches where the population has, has, uh, has declined. I also wanted to mention the steeple, which you cannot see here because the steeple is no longer on the church. The steeple was taken down, I believe it was in the 40s. I, you know, I, as a child, uh, born in this congregation, I have vivid memories of a steeple, but of course, that it's inaccurate because the steeple was taken down long before I was born. But in my mind's eye, there was a steeple there at one point. But no, no, it couldn't have been. I think it was taken down in the 40s, and I wasn't born until the 50s. As is true of many churches, this church has predecessor bodies, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, during my remarks today. But in, in one case, I want to go back to a, um, to a church in Norway uh, in, uh, called the Grua Church. The Grua Church is located in Skolstead, which is northwest of Kirkenar in Solar on the River Gloma. I know that's a lot of detail. Solar is the, is the nearest town of note, S-O-L-O-R. And on a trip that my parents and, uh, and, and Paula and I took in the, in the mid-90s, we visited this particular, uh, this particular location, which is home of both my mother's family and my father's family. The oldest section of this church stemmed from the 13th century and was built using the stay or stop method. The church was then rebuilt in the 1600s with the addition of two transepts. So they had the two transepts that were built with round hand-worked logs and one tall center tower. Above the nave and two transepts, there were wide galleries which enabled this church, which which when we visited, the site was sort of out in the middle of uh, the country, to house at one point between six and 700 people. It was a large building. The exterior of the church was covered with pine top. Calculations that were later done estimated that some 17 tons of pine tar had been applied to that church between the 1600s and 1822. Now on Pentecost, May 26th, 1822, 
190 years ago this month, the church was filled to capacity. It was a bright and hot Sunday early in the summer. In the middle of the sermon, preached that day by the vicar, whose name was Ivor Hesselberg, a fire broke out. It broke out in the outer wall of the southern transept, and soon the fire broke into the church. Within 10 to 15 minutes, the church was completely engulfed and soon burned to the ground. Evacuation was hampered in the way the doors had been constructed, and primarily, although there were several problems with the ingress and egress, and where people were, were descending from, uh, from, the, um, from the balcony and the like, the problem was mainly that the doors opened in. Panic arose in the church. Everyone fought with one another to escape. The official death count was 113. However, the figures 116 and 117 were also mentioned. Among the people who were incinerated, seven adult men, most of the men got out. 45 of the fatalities were children under 16 years of age. Many were trapped at the stairs coming down from the, uh, from the galleries. The unmarried women used to sit in that section. The Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian structure was such that you sat in your own groups. Those who managed to try to get out, though those who managed to get out tried to keep the doors open, but this was made more difficult by the pressure of the crowd and also the ferocious heat. Some saved themselves by jumping through windows, the vicar among them. Many of the survivors, however, had severe burns. Only one of the dead could be identified. When you think of that, one of the dead could be identified, and he, by the saber that he was carrying, that saber today is on display there in the sacristy of the Gorilla Church. The cause of the fire never quite discovered. One theory speculates that a spark from a fire vessel in which a church servant brought embers from the neighboring farm to light the altar candles. Uh, that could have ignited the wall. Another theory was that someone was experimenting with a burning glass outside the church. At any rate, it was the biggest fire disaster in the history of Norway. One of the consequences of the German, or of the Grua church fire was a law that was passed in Norway prescribing that all doors to public buildings must open outward. So the, 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 the doors you walk in today push out. If we had that fire today, we'd all escape. The Grua church fire and the losses that, that were suffered because of it were, were, were I, I mentioned it primarily because in many cases, people that, that um, immigrated to this country and this region were familiar with this episode. And, and it, um, how the course of history might have been different had those, uh, had those people lived. And, and obviously, it was disproportionately the young and the female that were, that were taken by that fire. At the time of the, when, when, when the Mormon church marked 125 years, um, we, had a, we had a public um, ceremony here, it was a, a, a great party. And at that time I was doing a little bit of research and I was, I was trying to think there must be people that I knew that were, that were born or alive the same year the church was built. So I asked my sister Sue, who has a, 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 lot of the, uh, a lot of the cemetery records, if she could help me out. And she found two people that I knew that were born in 1876. Nils Anderson was born in 1876, and Peter Nelson was born in 1876. Now, Peter Nelson is a great, great uncle of mine, and he was born the same year that the church was born. So in a peculiar way, I felt then, as I feel now, that through foggy memory, I can reach back to the founding of this church. Because if you know somebody that was born in that year, you feel that, and, and of course they were lifelong members here. They weren't, um, they, they, uh, they, they were still living when, after I was born, although they died probably shortly thereafter. But it, 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 it enables me to reach back to the founding of that church now 136 years ago. Some of the more interesting facts that I have, um, that I mind in looking through the history of this church. In World War I, this church sent 29 sons of the congregation uh, off to fight in service to their country, all but one of them returning. Imagine that. 29 
boys, and it was only boys then from the Mona Church, went off to fight in World War I. That's a remarkable accomplishment. Church services here were always held in Norwegian until 1938, at which point the switch was made. Now, the switch didn't happen overnight. First, there was sort of gradual, some things were done in Norwegian, some things were done in English. But by 1938, everything here was done in English. And that same year, or the year after, 1939, electricity came to the church. So, they talk about change in the church. That must have been two radical changes within two years. First of all, no more Norwegian. And second of all, electricity. Can you imagine? That would, that would have been revolutionary in the days, in the days of the church. By my count, there are now four um, current members of the congregation who are descendants of church founders. My dad, who's sitting here, my neighbor Mavis, who's sitting there, myself, and Mavis and Maine's daughter, one. Now, there may be others, but I think in, in the, that, that, that are lineal descendants of the founders of the church, I think that, that there are four of us. Now, there are, there are others who we know, but they, they, no, longer, they no longer worship here. I'm pleased to know that my mother, who's also here, is she has senior lifetime member status. So this is a this is a very distinguished honor. It means that you've been here your entire life. She was baptized here, confirmed here, married here, attended worship here faithfully all her life, and someday, although we hope not for quite a long time yet, we most certainly will gather here to mark the end of her earthly life. The Mona Church has always been uh, one congregation in either a two-point or a three-point parish. The other church that we have been in union with for our entire existence is the Six Mile Road Church, which is east of Lyle. That church being a little bit older than we are, making this one of, if not the, oldest continuous in relationship two-point Lutheran parish in, in the Midwest. There are many now where smaller churches have come together. We have always been yoked to Six Mile Road uh, because the Mona Six Mile Grove Congregation is part of the Southeast Minnesota Synod of the ELCA. The Mona Congregation represents the southernmost tip of the Synod. There are several other churches where they are built in county, uh, excuse me, just south of the uh, Iowa line that are also part of the Minnesota Southeast Minnesota Synod. But uh, I think we are the furthest south. I know that last year when I went to um, Synod Convention, which was held earlier this week, and I couldn't go this year, but um, your name tag lists the name of your church and also the name of your community. Well, the name of my church is Mona, and the name of my community, it, it, it really couldn't be St. Hansker because although well, that's the mailing address here, it's Mona really isn't in St. Hansker, and it really couldn't be Lyle because that would put us in this. So, so my, on my name tag, it said Kurt Meyer, Mona, Mona. And a number of people during the course of this, I also had a, a, a different color, um, uh, name tag, which meant people were supposed to come up to me and ask me about certain things that I knew about it. At any rate, <clears throat> a number of people came up to me and they said, so you're from Mona Mona? And I said, yes, yes. And, and they, uh, they said, Mona. Now, everybody there was from Minnesota. Isn't that the community where my parents or grandparents or great-grandparents came to buy March? I said, yes, it is. The number of people from north of the state line that think of Mona and kept the Mona grocery store open long past its expiration date, more or less, coming down to buy margarine in Mona in large measure because uh, the dairy lobby in Minnesota was sufficiently powerful that it uh, you could buy margarine in Minnesota, but it was white margarine and, and it looked really nothing like it looked like Crisco. And if you wanted to add color to it, you had to buy a little color packet and squeeze it out. But in Iowa, you could buy blue bonnet that looked like it should look. And so people would come down primarily from Austin to buy cases of blue bonnet, keeping the, uh, the Mona store um, open probably five or 10 years longer than otherwise would have been possible or necessary. During one period of time, Mona and Six Mile Grove were part of a three-point parish with Our Saviors in Lyle, a church that was founded in 1911. They celebrated their centennial last year. Mona and Grove were sufficiently large and vibrant congregations that there was really little need for an additional Lutheran church in Lyle, which was a town 
one mile north of Mona, and the three miles west of a six mile road. Now, in the late 50s, you can describe this several different ways. You can say either the relationship dissolved, or you could say our saviors in Lyle pulled out of this three way relationship, a decision that is now 50 plus years old. The old American Lutheran Church Synod, which the three congregations had been part of, pressed Mona and Grove at that time, pushed them for, toward uh, consolidation. Mona and Grove decided, however, to go it alone together. And after half a century, now this happened in uh, 1959, after more than a half a century, most of the hard feelings that came about because of that have eroded. You must know that Norwegian Lutherans tended toward rather long memories, especially with respect to church-related matters. A thumbnail sketch of our congregation's founder, Klaus Klaassen. I mentioned him earlier, a remarkable man, a remarkable man. He was born a Dane. Uh, he was born on a Danish island in 1820. He first envisioned a law career um, when contact with the Grundtvigian Awakening in Denmark, and Grundtvig was a prominent Danish theologian, turned him to theology. Uh, Klaassen had ill health, which plagued him much of his life, and that brought his studies to an end. He traveled to Norway primarily with hopes to be sent to Africa as a missionary. Instead, however, uh, he came to the United States as a missionary uh, to teach among the growing Norwegian immigrant population. At Muskego in Wisconsin, which I mentioned earlier, Kossel was ordained in 1843 by the German Buffalo Synod, thus becoming the first ordained pastor to serve among the Norwegian congregations at, uh, at the, the Norwegian congregation at Muskego. Ten years later, in 1853, he and a group of some 75 Norwegian immigrants left Wisconsin and worked their way to Mitchell County, where he is regarded as the founder of St. Ansper, a community named after the ninth, the ninth century archbishop and patron saint of Denmark. It's said that, um, that Ansper did a lot of his work in Sweden, and unfortunately, that sort of the tides of history had washed up and, and sort of eroded much of the good work that Ansper had done there. However, he is still, of course, uh, revered in certain sections of the, uh, of the world. Among the notable congregations founded by Boston, both Mona and Six Mile Road, First Lutheran in St. Ansper, which was really the mother of Norwegian Lutheran Church, Rock Creek Lutheran Church, which, which Penny uh, mentioned earlier, another hidden gem. Nazareth Lutheran in uh, Cedar Falls, one of the largest, if not the largest, in uh, the Cedar Falls Waterloo area. And St. Olaf Lutheran in Austin, another uh, large and successful thriving church. Throughout his career, Clausen sided with the centrists within the Norwegian uh, American Lutheran movement and took part in repeated efforts to organize and unite this group. His pastoral work saw him travel extensively in North Iowa and southern Minnesota, carried before the Norwegian Lutherans and launching Lutheran congregations. He founded and edited two Norwegian language newspapers and contributed significantly to other immigrant and church-related publications. Klaassen took part in the organizing of the Norwegian Synod in the 1850s and then the Norwegian Danish Conference in the 1870s. In the church debate about slavery, and Clausen was very involved in this debate, Clausen stood with lay members in opposition to the majority of pastors who were aligned with the Church of Norway. Their objections to slavery, while considerable, were less absolute. Clausen said, slavery is evil. There's just no question about it. During the Civil War, then Clausen served as a chaplain for the largely Norwegian 15th Wisconsin Regiment, and there are people who have devoted their entire lives and careers to studying the 15th Norwegian um, Wisconsin Regiment. Early in his service, an injury uh, caused by an explosion in, a, in an area off the southern tip of Missouri led to his discharge and had effects for the remainder of his life. For several years, he lived in Virginia, partly in an effort to regain his health, uh, health and then eventually he returned to the Midwest and he spent his last few years living in Austin, Minnesota. He died then in 18. 92. Today, the Mona congregation is known for a number of things. It's known far and wide for its state supper. It's held in March. That's a tradition that began in 1976 
to mark and ultimately to raise funds for the church's centennial. There have now been 37 state suppers, and if you've never been, the 38th is scheduled for next March, and you are welcome. You can certainly uh, come. We'd love to have you. The congregation is also known for summer driving services. I don't know if you've noticed this building that sits out here. The, um, the, the, the slogan is, come as you are, sit in your car. Last summer, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of these service. The program consists of music and message, with greater emphasis in recent years on the music that carries the message. The drive-in building is worth note. It was originally a chicken coop. And uh, nevertheless, now for 40 plus years, it has been part of the sacred space here in, in Mona. The congregation is also known far and wide for its commit, uh, commitment to mission, including and perhaps especially international mission outreach, Christian outreach in two, two points on the map, uh, Oaxaca, which is in uh, Mexico, and in Nairobi, uh, which is in Kenya, Africa. And there have been active outreach missions in those, in those ports of call, not just in this church, but in part driven by people in this church for, um, for in the case of, of Oaxaca, for several decades, and in the case of, uh, of Nairobi, for uh, six years now. I also wanted to mention that music has been an important and essential aspect of this, of this congregation, and, and especially today, I, I promised to music, and, and, and we'll have music in just, in just a minute or two. I wanted to call attention to music as a, as a trailing indicator of a church's, um, uh, of, of a congregation's heritage. And um, I have had the pleasure of worshiping in other congregations. And you know how there are many different variations of, of, of various hymns that work their way into the, into the, um, into the, 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 the lifeblood of a congregation. Well, when there are various tunes, you can all, often tell which, by, by which tune is used, which, um, w w which heritage you're drawing on. And, and that's certainly here true of, um, of, of the Mona Church. In, in most cases, you'll note that the Mona Church, because of its Norwegian heritage, it often would select hymns that are part of the canon here, um, that are familiar through the Norwegian uh, ancestry. And in, in anticipating uh, some songs that I could, that I could, um, that I could share with you, I, I discovered that among the more prominent Norwegian composers is a man named Ludwig Matthias Linden, Lindemann. And he was born in 1812. This makes it the bicentennial of, of his, his birth, which is being celebrated with relish, actually, in Norway. Um, so, the 200th anniversary of L. M. Lindemann's birth. Who was L. M. Lindemann? He was one of the outstanding personalities of his time. He was active as an organist, as a choral conductor, as a composer, as a collector of folk music from many parts of the country, an educator, and not least of what we would call today a strategist of cultural policy. I think that's a great title, strategist of cultural policy. He established Norway's first music conservatory, an institution that after 90 years as a private school was to become the Norwegian Academy of Music. He promoted public music education by publishing a wide variety of songbooks, collections of tunes, and choral pieces. He lobbied politicians for aid in fostering a musical environment based on national traditions as well as European influences. At national occasions, he was always the composer of choice and also performer of choice. And in 1871, he represented Norway internationally as a specially invited organ soloist for the dedication of the great organ at Royal Albert Hall in London, together with the great musicians Anton Bruckner and Camille Sesson. He was instrumental in establishing Oslo's Philharmonic Society and was organist and cantor at the capital's main church, which is now the Oslo Cathedral for 50 years. His legacy is of major importance and, of, and is, according to the Norwegian website, is very much alive today. He wrote many melodies, including some 69 hymns that are now contained in the, in the official Church of Norway hymnal, 
Well, Lindemann wrote a number of songs that we know here at the Mona Church, and I'm going to uh, play several for you now, uh, and, then, and then one after a bit. Um, and, and you may recognize them. I'm going to play them on uh, the... We, we don't have a pipe organ at Mona, but we have a pump organ at Mona, which means the organist has to be in a reasonably good physical condition to carry out the duties. Nevertheless, there's not a lot of volume, so you may have to listen closely. I'm going to play two songs. The first being Jesus Priceless Treasure. The tune, in, in most hymnals, this, this has a tune which was arranged by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. This is not that tune. This is, however, an, an exceptional, exceptional melody. I was reading um, on a Lindemann website where uh, an organist from St. Louis had written in, talking about the song, and, and I tend to agree, of course you, you re you're reinforced by those that agree with you. It is, hold your breath lovely, gentle, quiet, devout, perfectly formed, with a joyful tenderness that seems to smile through tears. It is, simply put, one of the most hauntingly beautiful hymn melodies I have ever heard. When I read that, I said, I gotta play that. You know, I have to play that. Now, the second one I'm going to play, we sang last Sunday, and we sang it to the words of Jesus, like a shepherd lead us, but we also know it as, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Uh, this tune is uh, the same, the same writer said, I find this tune a bit on the mushy side, and it has a few challenging intervals, which if you don't know it, may throw you for a loop. But of course, all Norwegians know it anyway. Um, he, he said, I don't think it shows Lindemann at the height of his inspiration. I tend to like it, however. So I'm going to play these two songs, and you can uh, tell me a little bit later about these things.
harder work than it looks like. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to close by suggesting that there are many, many indications that maybe, as is true of many institutions, or even many buildings, you say maybe the greatest days are coming. Maybe those times are over. Maybe, maybe it's in the past, maybe it's history. And certainly you reflect on this, and we reflect on this at the Image County Historical Society where I'm involved. We reflect on this at, at the Image County Historic Preservation Commission. We reflect, we, we reflect on this in many different ways and in many different aspects of our life. Earlier this year, we, um, as part of the annual report that's, that's assembled by, um, by Mona and at Six Mile Grove, and we do that together, we had the reports of the various congregations, and it was my uh, responsibility as uh, the president of the Mona congregation to put together a report. And I just wanted to share with you what, uh, what I said then, and this was dated January of 2012. Mowing, ushering, teaching, singing, baking, driving, shoveling, foaming, all expressions of our ministry at Mona Lutheran Church. Bible reading, caregiving, corn freezing, candle lighting, facets of our life together in Christ. Hands that peel potatoes, hands that fold in prayer, hands that grip ingredients, hands to cradle a, new, a, a, a newborn. God's work, our hands. And that's our theme here for, for uh, the Senate. One of the great benefits, and of course one of the great challenges of being part of a small congregation is that almost every meaningful ministry requires all hands on deck. There simply is not a lot of room to hide when it comes to caring for church property, when it comes to preparing for and then serving the state supper, or recruiting a choir to sing at Easter. Whether it be with corn, candles, or kids, when we dedicate even our humblest efforts in service to our Lord, these acts are transformed in a magnificent way. We connect our efforts with those that have taken place throughout time and throughout the world. Our small tasks are elevated to sacred status, I dare say as important in God's eyes as tasks carried out by any disciple or saint or bishop. Hundreds, if not thousands, of small acts, small sacred acts, take place every month in, for, and through the modern church. And 2011, the year that I was reflecting upon at the time, was certainly no exception. In no particular order, we celebrated with a class of four new conferences. That was a, a, a recent record. Four new conferences. We refreshed and rededicated our dining room gathering space in time. We rang the bell loudly at what we call summit school, because we've been meeting on Wednesday evenings rather than Sunday school, telling the entire community that we had gathered in the name of Christ. We hosted the Zumbro River Conference of our synod. We served hundreds of delicious meals to our friends and neighbors and reveled in the fellowship of the state supper, the best church supper in the region, although our Norwegian heritage keeps us from making that claim out loud. <laughs> oh, I just did. We rejoiced in our steadfast and, and enthusiastic support for the Oaxaca ministry. We heard firsthand from Pastor Peter from Nairobi about his Bible work and ours interacting with the children from the slums of Indirati. We helped sponsor our 40th summer season of drive-in services. We came together for Bible school, engaging 40 participants of all ages. We sent five youngsters between the ages of, I think, 8 and 13 for an unforgettable overnight at a Goodert village, an experience they were still talking about four and five months later. And we met faithfully and expectantly in worship to hear the word, to sing praises, to reflect on thought-provoking sermons, 
and to nourish our souls. Although this list is long, I know it's just the tip of the iceberg, and that 2012, whether, and, and that each 2012 highlight, whether listed or not, requires the combined energies of many. Small acts of service are an essential part of our ministry at Pomona Church. I am forever grateful of the imprint that these acts have made and continue to make upon my life. I thank God for the opportunity to be in ministry with the people of Pomona Lutheran Church. Respectfully submitted to Kurt Meyer, President of Pomona Lutheran Church, January 9th, 2012. I would like to close with one more Lindemann song, and this, this song is special. It's not a particularly haunting melody, but it is the song that accompanied words that were written by a woman named Martha Fossen. Martha Fossen was the wife of Foss Fossen. We don't think much about her because really shortly after he arrived in this country and had begun his ministry, Martha passed away. In fact, Foss sort of shocked the world when she died in, in, in November, and he remarried, I think it was in January, maybe in, in, in February, shockingly soon. At, at any rate, uh, Martha, prior to her leaving Norway, wrote the words to this next hymn, and it is, it's, it's called, it's, it's really called a party. And it is, it's, it's one of those wonderful, um, well, I, I would, let me read the words for you. <coughs> Two verses. And of course, you love this in Norwegian, you know, to translate it. So it loses some of the elegance. Don't blame Martha. And now we must bid one another farewell. The peace of our God keep you ever. God's peace in our bosom and all will be well, or whether we meet or we sever. May Christ, our dear Lord, be our sure reward when we from this world pass forever. Oh, help us, dear Father, and Christ, thou the Son, that gladly our course we may finish. And thou, Holy Spirit, thou comforting one, thy love in our hearts so replenish, that we by thy might might fight the good fight, Till one is the crown everlasting. She wrote that in 1830, about the time that she and her husband were planning to leave for, um, for a new life here. It, I think, reflects the sadness that was in her heart about leaving everything that she knew and coming to a new world. And as I say, she didn't live uh, a terribly long life. She died before they moved to the uh, company. But let me play a couple of. Uh, of Gogons with the tune written by Ludwig Lindemann, whose bicentennial and celebrated. I've been suffering from a bit of a cold, so I, I will attempt <coughs> to sing a verse for you. 